Tonight, so that you may know and learn, I will tell you stories about our people, Bribri. I will explain how our god Sibu created the world, created the earth, created the sea, and all human beings. You shall learn about every rule and principle he left to our people, so that we may survive in this world. Here I am, a couple of cable lengths away from the coast of Costa Rica. The warm and nourishing waters of the Caribbean Sea carry me slowly towards the discovery of a new people, the Bribri, a community hidden somewhere among the mountains. Before I can reach them, I must make the acquaintance of the coast's inhabitants. <laughs> I'm from Panama, but it's been 38 years since I moved to Costa Rica. I came here to fish spiny lobsters, a fisherman's life. I started going out to sea when I was nine. I'm 66 today, and in a month I'll be 67. And I'm still going out to sea. I wanted my children to study. I even advised them against going to sea, at least not to work there, because today if we don't study, we have nothing. If I'd studied, I wouldn't be on the sea today because it's dangerous. This one has eggs. We leave it in the creel until it's laid them. Even though it's a good job, I didn't want them to follow in my footsteps. I wanted them to study so they'd become, I don't know, teachers or doctors, something like that. But, well... They like fishing, so I had to accept it. Being a fisherman is a worthy and honourable work. We steal from no one. People think right away that being a fisherman isn't much, but I don't mind because I know I'm working honourably. So that's it. It's a job my children enjoyed, and so they're welcome. All in all, it's a good job. <laughs> Since I've been living here on the coast, I've never dealt with the Indians. When I was in Panama, there was some sort of, of tradition with black people on one side and Indians on the other. We didn't really have much contact, you could say. Well, actually, we did. When we fished, they would take the fish and give us vegetables in exchange. Yes, I remember. We used to come with a boat full of fish and leave with a boat full of vegetables. That was our deal with them.
On that side of the border, the locals are called Bribris or Kabekaris. They used to live along the coast. But when the Spanish came in the 16th century, their whole way of living was turned upside down. The natives then withdrew inland, moving ever deeper into the mountains. Nowadays, there's a mix of people living on the coasts. With their origin on the islands just in front of the country, such as Haiti or Jamaica, these inhabitants of the Caribbean brought with them a culture, a way of life, practices and techniques that were unknown to the locals. Well, here we try to take care of the reefs because, in truth, everyone gains from it. We also do it so that my grandchildren may grow up knowing what a reef is, what a coral is, what a red snapper or a spiny lobster is. Taking care of it is of the utmost importance. While closing in on the foothills of the Talamanca Cordillera, the highest mountain range in Central America, I go through the inevitable intensive banana farms that standardize the landscape and pollute the environment with their chemical spreading. The other major cultivation in the region is cocoa, and there are still a couple of small, traditional and family-owned farms here and there, which grow the legendary pod. Cocoa consumption nowadays is so globalised that we forget that this plant, blessed by the indigenous gods, only grew in Central America. Indeed, it's from the gentle slopes of these hills, offering both the perfect amount of sun and rain, that the precious beans invaded the world to become chocolate. Before all this area was pure cocoa, and then everything disappeared because of the cocoa tree disease. It was because of the Americans who spread chemicals to kill off the patches and thus buy the lands at a cheap price to cultivate bananas. That's terrible, isn't it? I come every two weeks and cut off the pods that are ripe. We cut them, open them, put them in crates, clean them well, and then fermentation begins. During the first two days, we let everything rest and we don't touch the cocoa at all. We control the fermentation temperature and take good care that there's no air pockets. Then we start mixing during four, five or six days, depending on the customer's taste. Once fermentation is complete, we move on to drying. We start by spreading in thick layers because it continues to ferment for a while. And every hour we must mix everything. If you want to obtain a good product and there's sun, like today, you can count 15 days drying. When I take some cocoa in the palm of my hand and I smell it, it must not smell humid. Wet, it must smell like a flower. When it's like this, it means the cocoa is perfect. Cacao perfecto.
I truly think I will continue working in the cocoa business now. I have a daughter and a granddaughter, and I hope that when I'm gone, my granddaughter will take over and continue the tradition. Right now, I don't want to sell. Even if I'm offered millions, I won't sell. My father and my mother left all this to me. I must continue the family tradition. Nowadays, a couple of white people start working in this business, sometimes Indians, but cocoa has always been black people's business. You'll see almost no Indians around here. There are none in this region. They're all over there, near Bribri or Sixayola. There are a couple of dark-skinned people around here, but not many. In any case, no, there are no Indians in the area. You know, in order to build the road to here, we had to remove some trees, and when I saw this, I almost started to cry. When I see someone striking a tree with a machete, it's like I get hit, because I love these trees so much. Cocoa is fantastic. In my quest to find the Bribri, it's become clear that I must leave the coast. It's good life and mild weather. To reach the mountains and their territory, the path is long. Our history tells that in the times of darkness, everything we see today on our planet was in the beginning spiritual beings. Sometimes they looked like people, but they were in truth gods, spirits, not human beings. Sometimes they looked like trees or stones. From these ancient times, we have kept many rules, many norms that allow us to live in harmony in the world, with the forest, with the trees, and with the animals. From here on, no more bridges. No more asphalt on the roads, no more electricity. As I draw closer to the natives' lands, nature assumes again a central role, or rather its central role. In exchange, life's small things become more difficult and must be earned with some effort. Welcome everyone to your radio, the voice of Talamanca. We now move on to today's classified ads. The next one is about Shirole's new farming hope. Diamara and her husband Carlos ask all their neighbours to join them next weekend for a chichada. They're organising for the construction of their new house. <laughs> Radio waves are much better at passing the treetops and going deep to the bottom of the valleys than cell phone waves. Because each family has a radio receiver on during the classified ads, it's easy for the most secluded farms to keep a connection with the rest of the community. Indeed, some inhabitants are several hours of forest walk away from one another.
To reach the heart of Bribri territory, I have to travel up the river. The journey doesn't end here, and I now enter the lushness of an ancestral forest, a primitive place that reached our time thanks to the miracle of adaptation, an ecosystem shaped by thousands of years of evolution, where fauna and flora live in symbiosis in an incredible entanglement. Predator and prey, canopy giants and lichen on the roots, mammals, reptiles and insects, they all live together and fight for light and life in a global equilibrium that only a great plague would seem to be able to disturb. I married a Bribri woman, a Bribri Indian, and I have to say that when I came here, it demanded a lot from me. It was very tough. We had nothing. Neither my wife nor I had money. We were extremely poor. I came through the mountain. There was absolutely nothing and we had to build everything. We worked during a whole year. It was really tough. We didn't have clothes to wear. We had a bad diet and many things didn't go well. One needs to imagine that there was no farm here at the time, only jungle. How should I put this? Uh, for us, a person that isn't indigenous, we call her Sikwa. Bribri or Indians call these people Sikwas. We see the world of Sikwas as different from ours. My wife, Jomara, comes first in order, and then me, Carlos. Why me second? Because my wife is Bribri and I am Sikoa. And here in Talamanca, foreigners and men have neither power nor control. It is them, Indian women, that have power here, not men. If I notice that he is doing something inappropriate, that could, how can I put this, 
alter the order of things, it is my role to attract his attention and tell him that he can't do that for one reason or another. The rules we indigenous people have are very clear and followed by all, especially the fact that women here are tasked with passing on the culture. I can't just come here and set my rules. Laws are established by the Indian person. Indians set the laws. My job is to support her, that's all. We came here with the goal of planting basic cereals, rice, beans, corn, everything we can eat, and animals too. However, when it comes to medical plants, most of them were already in this place, and we found them because we know them and can identify them. We just had to clean the surroundings. We don't cut them, we only take care of them. They were here and will remain here. Each family has, on its land, a certain number of endemic medicinal plants. It means that we don't find the same plants on everyone's land, since some of them only grow in a very specific ecosystem that the untrained eye will have a very hard time discovering. Among the Bribri community, there's an expert in the field, the traditional doctor, the one that is called Awa. Sometimes I go to see the Awa doctor, because I have some plants that must be blended with others. So in that case, yes, I visit him. However, if it's the flu or something similar, then no, because I know exactly what I need to take. So I only visit the Awa for very specific things. When I need to mix several plants, I have to be careful. I go to see him and he tells me how many leaves of a given plant I have to take and what to mix it with. The native woman has the privilege of being the mother of the clans. She's the one giving continuity to the clan. She gives it life. The woman bears the name of the clan, not the man. For instance, when a young boy is getting ready to become an hour doctor, the ceremony and rites of passage must be carried out in the presence of a woman, of the mistress of ceremonies. There must always be a woman to validate this passage. It is the only way for the future Awa to be able to carry out his job correctly. The Awa is one of the pillars of Bribri culture, a knower, a keeper of the history and memory of a people who until recently only lived through oral tradition. The Awa is a middleman between our earthly lives and the vast cosmogony of the underworld that is so dear to the Bribri. Healer and expert in the properties of plants, the local inhabitants come to visit him all the way to his usura to receive his sound advice. We are in the traditional house. 
We call it Usuri in Bribri. Our god Sibu gave it to us to live in. The Usuri is supported by eight pillars symbolizing the eight most important clans of the Bribri tribe. The roof is tied with lianas, and these knots are the stars in the universe. In the center, there's the belly button from which men and the earth are born. The belly button is symbolized by this basket that hangs in the center of the Usuri. In this basket are corn cobs, because it is from corn that Sibu gave birth to all men, without distinction between ethnicities or races. The earth is alive and the liquids it contains, such as water for instance, are of the utmost importance for us. We're not allowed to extract any liquid or any ore from its bowels because it is her body. Iriria is alive. It's important to understand that if we let human beings extract ore, oil or gold, Iriria can quickly die. Iriria is our land to all of us. It is a female figure that brings a lot of blessings. Oil is like her blood and we mustn't extract it because she draws strength from it. She has a beating heart. She contains a great energy and we can clearly feel her vibrations during earthquakes. It is the expression of her wrath because of all the impacts human beings force her to bear. The Awa title is inherited from the mother. Then there's a long period of learning that starts at an early age within the family and then with a master. But in the end, the community is the one validating the status of Awa. It is passed down from one generation to the next. <laughs> To become our, one must count 12 years of studies, and teaching usually starts around 11, 12 years old. It can vary. It all depends on how much knowledge the teacher, who is also our, of course, passes on. Personally, the moment my master allowed me to sit in the hammock of the Usuri left its mark on me. I will never forget this. Sitting in the hour's hammock is a true investiture. It is a sacred place. Not just anyone can reach this objective. It has always been my goal. Since I was a child, I had to make it. And today I feel like I'm part of something bigger. My work as an hour lets me live a unique, very strong and very beautiful relationship because I'm in touch with the elements, with the sun, water, wind, with the fire, the stars, the cosmos. I'm in touch with the stones Sibu gave me to heal. I can communicate. It's obviously difficult to explain like this, but I can feel the importance of these stones. The stick that I carry everywhere is a very important relic for my work. It's a bit like the machete the farmer carries with him to cut bananas. There's also the small bag attached to my belt. It's a chakra. It's the same kind of bag one brings to a field to harvest fruits. I need it to carry the magic stones. The native people of Costa Rica always seem to have had a unique relationship with the mineral world. The Bribris give it a very special attention because the stones they own were handed down to them by their god, Sibu, to allow them to communicate with the underworld and to heal on the earth. Where we from the Western world see only inert matter, the natives instead feel a power within them and venerate them. And so the smallest displacement of these huge stones leads to a perfectly codified ceremony.
la traen de muy lejos. These stones come from far away, far away. On Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays, they cut the wood. On Fridays, they put the stone in a basket made of ropes and let the stone rest a whole day without touching it. Some people then come to keep an eye on it whilst, you know, smoking a cigar. Then on Saturday, the journey begins. Thirty or forty people take turns carrying it during the whole trip so that they can rest. If there's a pregnant woman, both her and her husband are forbidden from going to see the stone. Otherwise, it could break or remain stuck on the ground. And even a hundred people wouldn't be able to move it. We also need to feed everyone participating, from the oldest to the youngest. And so it is in our culture. Sometimes, in the middle of the night, I've heard the noise of the stones. It was in the middle of the night, but there was no one around. I heard grinding, but there was nobody. Can you imagine? Stones starting to grind, just like that, in the middle of the night. All of these things are signs. The stones send signs. Moreover, when there's an earthquake, we use these stones. We use them to calm the earth, to calm its tremors. The Bribri actually live in a multicultural world. And some of these cultures dominate and crush ours. And so, if we don't get help from our government by doing things as simple as protecting our language, It is truly possible that future generations will forget it.
Our community from Yorkin has forgotten a lot of things those last couple of years. We almost didn't speak Bribri anymore here. But here we are, and we have the will to keep the lifestyle of our culture. We have it within reach and we don't want it to die. There's one thing I believe is really important. I think that because of globalization, we find ourselves handicapped. As of today, the youngsters are ashamed of speaking Bribri. They're not interested. They actually feel like people from the outside, like Sikawas, and they're no longer interested in their own culture. They're almost ashamed of it. And so we, at schools, take all those values and teach them. So now we're going to study animals a bit. So how do you say animals in Bribri? My father told me that 50 years ago or so, if they heard a child speaking Bribri at school, he was punished and forced to get down on his knees on small stones or corn seeds. Some of the pupils' parents from the community tell me that because of this, their own father never taught them to speak Bribri, and so today they can't speak it. Give me the name of an animal we can find in your house, a pet. Yes, a dog. And how do you say dog in Bribri? Chichi. Chichi. Do you know any other pets? The horse? Hmm. The horse. Children, I'm going to tell you something. The word horse cannot be written in Bribri. Do you know why? Because horses were brought by the Sikawas, by the Spanish. The Spanish brought them by boat. Originally, there were no horses on our lands. The teacher also focuses on the cultural part, the handicraft, the customs, the traditions, the history, and explains our cosmogony. This is the teacher's role here. I'll tell you what I truly think. I'm convinced that here, in our little community of Yorking, we're moving in the right direction. And I don't think I'm wrong. We strive to keep the culture alive, although we almost lost the most important part, the language. And by the way, few people speak Bribri nowadays, but here we strive to keep our Bribri traditions alive. This year we'll start teaching handicraft, and we'll teach the children about their own history too. We'll ask elders from the community to come to speak, so they can tell Bribri stories. We will also create a botanical garden with medicinal plants. This will be a pedagogical area so that they may know how to cultivate and recognize all kinds of plants. This will be a place of knowledge.
pero si él está amarillo, entonces ya lo podemos cortar. ¿Qué crees? ¿Le falta o no? Le falta. Entonces vamos a dejar. Education is necessary to bring a society forward, but it cannot do everything. An important part of the culture cannot be taught, it's handed down. It's inherited from the elders, who carry a knowledge that isn't learned in the classrooms, but that is gained on the long run. During these moments we spend hearing, listening, watching, understanding. This is precisely the difference between something we learn, that remains attached to the person, and something passed on, that goes on through generations. It is important that other cultures respect ours, listen carefully and learn about us. Nowadays, there are quite a number of books written by indigenous people on worldview, their relationship to the world, to the environment and how to live in harmony with nature. The world is fragile. We are fragile. And yet, some animal or plant species manage to stand the test of time, just like a miracle. Is it because they proved stronger than others during tough times? More adaptable in evolution? More discreet amongst the many? It doesn't matter. They're here now. And we have but to understand how lucky we are in being able to enjoy watching them. We must accept that their presence gives us a responsibility from now on, for the world is fragile. There are sacred trees. There are, of course, many trees, and they all matter. But some of them are especially sacred, and so Cebu tells us, you cannot touch those trees, you cannot cut them down, you will suffer from tooth decay if you do. And if you use them to build your house, you can even die. The message sent over the radio seems to have worked. Without caring much for the rain or thick mud, come morning, the neighbors are gathering to give a hand to build a new house. When I first came to this mountain, everywhere I heard, hey, look, there's a Sikawa. What's he doing here, this foreigner? And where is he from? They were suspicious, and it took me a lot of time to be accepted by the Bribri, because I was a Sikawa and nobody knew me. I've now been with them 18 years. I am a Sikawa, but I feel fully Bribri. 
siento completamente bribri. One should know that the Indian rarely mixes with the foreigner, with the white man. It's not common for them to fall in your arms, they keep to themselves. But with time, I earned their trust through my marriage, through my job, and now I must say we live the real life. Pura vida. A person that isn't a native, that isn't indigenous, must not, how can I explain, must not get involved in the ceremonies or even the songs we have. There are spaces she cannot enter, even if she wanted to, she couldn't, because it isn't part of our culture. There are, there are very sacred things that only Bribri do, that not just anyone can do. And it's not because I'm Bribri that I can do everything either. No, we have our rules. Some things take place in some clans while being forbidden in others. We own a bank, a bank that takes the shape of trees. Because if you own this tree reserve, you truly own a bank in your house. No need to go withdraw some money with your card at the National Bank or the Bank of Costa Rica. No, we have this bank right within our reach in the shape of wood. All those trees around us, they're like a bank for us. We can turn that wood into money any time we want. It generates colonies. We choose a trunk, we ask for a permit to cut it down, we sell it and we get the money. There's a great mystery with the Bribris. They have their very own rhythm. And not just any Sikwa can settle down here. They have to feel fraternity. And this fraternity in turn becomes a pact, some kind of purification. Then they give you a blessing that links you to them. The Indians have their gods, their culture, and lucky for me, I have that culture now. I practice it. I've gained it. To people wishing to discover our culture, I would say that they can, but with respect. That they understand our vulnerability and our innocence, if I can put it this way. That we don't do things with ill intent. 
So let them come, but not to stir up troubles. Hostile, intimidating, and impenetrable. This is usually what we think about complicated things when we're happy only with the surface. And yet with feelings and time, we go deeper and end up discovering a rich and varied world that could even make us a better person. Here they are, the Bri Bri beliefs. All of this is very important. Everything has a meaning, an origin. And this origin isn't human. It comes from the gods who gave it to us. Now, we must share it among ourselves and draw lessons from it. The world isn't waiting, and I'm eager to meet it. <laughs> 